so let's shift to potpourri. Um, we had a question about bikes on Macs. Yes. Uh, I often see uh, Macs vehicles that have all four bike racks full and uh, often bikes in the, uh, the mobility device area as well. Sometimes I'm one of them. Um, any opportunity to figure out how to get more bicycles onto a Macs car? Um, so right now we think we're at about the max, uh, no, no pun intended, I guess, related to the number of bikes that we can put on a max car. And some people have suggested, for example, where we have two hooks, could you put three? We've looked through that and gone through the physics of that. And what happens is the handlebars begin to impede the mm -hmm. flow within the aisles and the ability of, of others to move around. So when I would say, first of all, is that um, you're talking to a transit guy who really believes the connection between uh, the, 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 the transit system bikes is incredibly important and one that we really have to accommodate. Um, I don't know that we can always accommodate the number of the, on, on the vehicles themselves, but the other thing to think about in that just regard, to regards to that is that as we add more service, we'll also add more bike capacity, whether it's bus or train. So that's a, that, that would be a positive note. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that we um, have really tried to um, uh, tread new territory with the Portland-Milwaukee uh, light rail, move into a broader um, um, acceptance and uh, embracing of, of bikes and, and uh, the accessibility they provide. Um, one impressive statistic is that of the overall Portland-Milwaukee project, there's about $40 million of active transportation improvements that are going along with it, and some really important connections in southeast Portland as well as in, in the Milwaukee area being made. Um, the other thing we've done is really um, sort of not, not that I would say that the Portland code is bad, but we were saying <laughs> that it was inadequate when it came mm -hmm. to transit to bikes on, uh, at transit stations. And so I think by code we had to have like eight stations. And what we've done is really um, sort of start over with um, sort of other kinds of storage facilities that really have increased that number just completely dramatically uh, at our various stations along the line. Mm -hmm. So I think our bike riding customers will find great access and great facilities when we open this line. Um, and we're trying to retrofit some of those things along uh, the rest of our system as well. We're interested in a <coughs> bike and ride sort of um, uh, facility, storage facility in the Goose Holler area, as well as Narenko. Those are sort of up on our next, on our list as well. Hmm. Well, I've, I've actually been pushing for a thorough <coughs> rewrite of the bike parking portion of Portland Zoning Code. So <laughs> I will take your observation as evidence uh, yeah. in that effort. Um, <laughs> Slightly connected to that, what do you think about bike share uh, in central Portland as part of the answer to that? So if you're, if you're doing sort of bike park and ride at one end of your trip, if there's then a bike share bike available at the other end, does that help the equation? I think it helps the equation a lot. And I think it's a really, um, a really great um, accommodation of that, what we call in transit, that last mile connection. And I would tell you that I think there's a lot of places, in, not just downtown, but mm -hmm. in other parts of the region where I think that may become uh, important as well. We've been working, for example, with Nike about um, better connections to their campus mm -hmm. from, particularly as their campus grows, from our, uh, our, our Beaverton uh, Creek Transit Station. And you know, I begin to think about what if there were a nice sort of bike share arrangement between the central campus and that? And that would take care of the last mile for obviously a lot of uh, a lot of the employees there. So there are places where I think uh, I'd love to. The main reason that I'm such a great supporter of the bike share in Portland is I think it's a great place to begin to model that and then begin to see if we can replicate it in other parts of the region where it really might make sense as a last mile connection. Okay. The other technology you've been experimenting with is uh, car lock facilities for bicycle parking. Right. Um, I know the one at Sunset wasn't was the first one, but wasn't fantastically successful. Right. Uh, there have been some others. How are those doing? Uh, I would still say that we're anxious for more users uh -huh. on all of them. Um, but I, th I think the one at Beaverton is getting more heavily used, and I think that's more centrally located, uh -huh. probably in better. Uh, access terrain, and I think the one that that's one of the lessons is that you really need a good network mm -hmm. of, of streets and roads that are accommodating to bikes to really make those uh, particularly successful. Mm -hmm. Would you consider those at um, locations other than transit centers? You know, I think about 
you know, uh, interstate in Killingsworth, which mm -hmm. isn't a transit center, but probably has more passengers going yes. through than some transit centers do. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, is there any opportunity there to deploy? Sophisticated yeah, I think I th there is. I think it's a great idea. I think the question is space. And one of the things that we have been trying to do is as transit oriented developments occur in some of those locations, uh, is actually work with the developer to see if there's an opportunity to integrate a facility within that development. We've been working in Goose Hollow with, uh, with that in mind and also in Orinco. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, carbon emissions are on the mind of our readers. Mm -hmm. um, you added some hybrid buses to the fleet last year. We'd love to get an update on how, uh, how those are going. And uh, I think a lot of our readers would still love to see a zero carbon policy for TriMet at some point. How's your thinking evolving along those lines? Um, so first of all, um, our, our hybrids are doing a lot better than the first generation hybrids we had. So we are, we are seeing a substantial boost in uh, fuel economy. I'm not going to be able to quote you the numbers. I think they're a little bit five miles per gallon. and. Our normal buses are sort of four to four point eight. So, and I, so we, it's actually been um, noticeable and good in terms of their performance and their fuel economy. So that's that's better. I'm not sure the price difference justifies itself at this point in time entirely. Um, that's why we're demonstrating it. Uh, I would say here in the next year we will take delivery of what we think is sort of the third generation of hybrid, something we call super hybrid, and what it will do is take more of the load um, and put it into electrical uh, power as opposed to, um, you know, putting it on the diesel engine. So, uh, you know, at each step we begin to put more and more of the work of the diesel engine into the electrical system mm -hmm. and that will help reduce emissions and, and hopefully improve economy over time. That's the theory. So we'll be looking forward to doing that uh, as well. When it comes to carbon emissions, though, what I always want to do is step back and say and emphasize the incredibly important role of a transit system in getting the overall region's emissions down. And it's been um, really enlightening um, watching and following uh, Metro's uh, Climate Smart Communities effort overall. And I, th I think it would, wouldn't be an oversimplification to say that the tactics that have, com that have moved the dial in terms of total regional um, uh, carbon emissions the most have been those that are associated with transit and transit-oriented development. So some of the th scenarios they've tested, for example, are what would happen if you double transit service and you, end as a result, you ended up tripling mode share. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, you do end up with an, uh, an enormously um, effective, I think, reduction in carbon emissions overall. So one of the things about whether TriMet itself is zero carbon, um, I think you got to step back for the time being, given the time and era that we're in, and recognize this great role, the, the importance of the transit system in, in reducing carbon emissions overall. The third thing I'd say, maybe it's a third, I've lost count, uh, about this is that we are following really closely uh, electric bus technology. Um, our mechanics and technologists think that, that that technology has a lot of potential in the future. Uh, electric vehicles are simpler, they're easier to maintain, they're quieter, they have a lot of advantages. The problem right now is they're very expensive and the battery capacity doesn't allow a bus to go through its normal daily doodles, duty cycle mm -hmm. with, one, um, with one charge. So that means that if you put an electric bus into service, you've got to find a way to sort of tap off, the, right. uh, top off the battery at various locations during the day. And there's some um, systems that are coming on that we're really very interested in uh, that would allow us to do that at uh, transit center sites or layover sites, for example, and then allow the bus to get through its whole day. That's really been, I think that's the major obstacle for uh, in addition to cost and bringing the cost of uh, electric technology down. Uh, Are those rapid charging technologies or fast battery swap technologies? Rapid charging. Um, and there's really two styles. There's one, uh, one particular manufacturer has, for lack of a better, kind of a claw that comes down on top of the bus and does a rapid charge. I think in less than 10 minutes we'll charge it up. Another, um, or, and then there's more than one um, manufacturer also is beginning to offer induction charging from the mm -hmm. bottom, which would be uh, a magnet essentially mm -hmm. that gets charged up under 
the street. Mm -hmm. So interesting technology to keep our eye on, mm -hmm. and uh, we're really interested in it at TriMet. We'd love to demonstrate it, frankly. Well, we're talking about vehicles. Um, you know, the, the city of Portland, is, of course, is going through another exercise to look at funding at levels that will be sufficient to work on the maintenance backlog. It frequently, frequently gets quoted that the most destructive vehicle on the city streets is a TriMet bus because all the weight is placed on two axles. Uh, is anybody working on solving that problem? Um, there is a uh, uh, transit, Transportation Research Board study underway right now. Uh, and I actually, some initial findings um, Commissioner Novick actually shared with me here recently. But um, what it would, you have to be careful about solving one problem and causing another. So that's, there are a lot of trade-offs when you get to that. I would say, on it related to our latest buses, we have been doing a lot of work in terms of looking for lighter weight materials and mm -hmm. composites that go into that. Um, our 3100 series, for those who ride frequently, will know they have these plastic form seats. Mm -hmm. uh, the, th the year previous, they had sort of metal, um, if you will, stainless back seats. Um, moving to the plastic saved us on the order of 500 pounds of vehicle. So those are the kinds of changes that we can make and are making right now. Um, but, you know, frankly, the other part of this is that everybody wants the buses to be very comfortable now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's right, but that means air conditioning, which means weight. Um, frankly, if you begin um, to um, um, begin to think about some of the other technology, like battery technology, you have to be really careful of weight as well. So I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a immediate solution on the horizon, but there are some very smart people thinking about it. Nobody's proposed putting extra axles on a bus. Um, well, there's the problem with that is that you've got to sort of be careful about how you turn, mm -hmm. uh, and when you put the two wheels, you really restrict the turning ability of a bus, uh, unless you can figure out how to make that work mm -hmm. um, in a really high tech way, which okay. might be another problem. All right. Uh, our last question. Uh, by the way, the, the rear buses do have four tires, mm -hmm. and so there is, it's not okay. as if the, the, there is an attempt to spread the weight over those four tires in the rear. Okay. Our last question area is about electronic fares, mm -hmm. and uh, we're recording this on March 26th, and uh, TriMet put out a press release this morning saying that you selected a contractor uh, for your e-fare system. Can you tell us both what you've learned from the Globe Sherpa project and uh, what the prospects are with this new contractor? Um, so, uh, we're really excited about beginning to move into this new age. I often say that our fair system was the best of the 19th century. Um, <laughs> we have moved now beyond uh, newspaper tears to actually printed tickets, which I think maybe moved us a little bit closer to where we are today, but clearly we're behind the rest of the industry and the world in terms of fair technology. But that is an advantage for us right now because we can learn from the mistakes uh, of others. So I, as I like to say, it's a really good thing to be on the cutting edge, not the bleeding edge. And so I think that's exactly where we are with this electronic fare system. One of the things we did learn in moving to the uh, Globe Sherpa Transit app is uh, how quickly people adapted to it. Uh, literally, uh, I think we probably just about blew the lid off of their business plan in terms of the number of downloads that occurred in a very quick period of time. I think we're now up to 70,000 or so downloads. Um, and we've had, uh, I think we're well over a million dollars in ticket sales and, for, and growing very rapidly. So it's, it's been widely accepted and quite quickly. And I think that's one of the things we learned. I think people really like, and I hear from customers all the time, they really like the convenience of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's, that's an important thing. I think the other thing we learned from that, that we apply to that, is using something that's already in a lot of people's pocket is a really great way to advance um, uh, our convenience to those customers. Um, our contractor is Init Innovations, Inc., um, and they are currently installing a, a smart, um, uh, what we call account-based um, electronic fare system in Finland. Uh, they're working in Sacramento. They're working in a number of places around the world, Munich. So they're very experienced. They're bringing a really top-notch team. They really want to make this the U.S. model of, of, great, um, of a great fare system, and so we're anxious to be working with them. Um, and we do expect this will still take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not expecting implementation of this until 2017. 
and we're hoping that sometime after the opening of the Milwaukee Light Rail Project, we have some small group um, testing going on of it. So we won't turn the website on all at once. It will be done with some group tests where we begin to um, make sure that it's reliable before we turn it on. Um, I'd say th so there's a lot of advantages to it, and I think you know these very well, Chris, but uh, from our standpoint, if we can move people away from the ticket vending machines and from cash, that's uh, much more efficient for us in terms of the cost of, of collection, and it's much more reliable for the customers. Uh, to have account-based systems is really easy because people can just in their pocket and a couple clicks on the phone move money uh, into the account. Um, and again, this is a very flexible system. We're expecting that you'll be able to use the phone to, to pay. You could use a, a chip embedded credit or debit card, uh, or you could use a TriMet style um, MasterCard shopping card. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we also foresee is a very broad consumer network. So if you're at the 7-Eleven, you see a stack of, se of credit cards or, or uh, yeah, credit cards that you can buy as a gift mm -hmm. or use yourself that, you know, my hope is in the future you'll see one for TriMet, so they'll be available really just about anywhere. So one of the benefits that's been touted for electronic fares is the ability to uh, essentially buy a pass in pieces, right? That exactly. If you're, you're a frequent user, you could just buy your ticket every day, and when you hit the price at which you would have had a monthly pass, you'll stop getting charged. Right. Um, yeah, that's clearly a, an excellent feature. Um, but on the flip side of that, there's an equity question, right? Because the the people who are unbanked, don't have a smartphone, uh, will find it difficult to access the system, are typically the least advantaged people in our society. Mm -hmm. So if they're the ones who are kind of stuck using cash only, they're not getting those benefits. What are, what are TriMet's uh, ideas about addressing those equity challenges? Well, I think, First of all, the, the feature that you noted, the ability to apply those caps on either a daily basis or a monthly basis as it is, is a great enhancement in equity. So what we, what we hope that will do is encourage even the unbanked to move to the electronic system. Because even if you're unbanked, you can go under this proposed system to a local 7-Eleven or a ticket menu machine and use cash to add value to your card. And then on that card, those caps will be um, calculated for the customer. So that's, 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 that's the hope, is by, by a broad uh, consumer distribution network, we reach out to every neighborhood in the city, including those that aren't uh, particularly well-off neighborhoods, and make sure that, the, that those, uh, those means and mechanisms are available to everybody. And that's gonna be a big part of the job, of translating our, our system to the electronic system, and uh, we've known that from the get-go. But it offers that specific benefit, particularly uh, to uh, lower income riders, that I think really makes that uh, worth that transaction. The other thing I'd say is um, the cash never goes away. Mm -hmm. There will always be a cash fare on, on TriMet. Our goal is just to reduce it overall, given um, that, frankly, it's, a, it, it's expensive to manage it. Okay. Well, Neil, I'd like to thank you on behalf of our readers for taking the time with us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate all the questions and um, your readers' continued uh, ridership on TriMet. Thank you. Yeah.